what has been done will be done again, nothing is real, and there are no original ideas. This might sound terrible, but what that means is with all the retakes, remakes, and reimaginings, there's plenty of opportunity to improve on successful concepts, or at least cover them in a nice new coat of paint. Project Warlock is a Doom clone released back in the good year of 2018. Developed by Buckshot Software, that, at the time of initial development, consisted of one Polish man named Jacob Sislow. Why should you care? Because he made this while he was still in high school. Save some tale for the rest of us. While you were simping over early VTubers in a dark, stinky room, Jacob was hard at work kickstarting his development career. Keep this in mind while you watch the rest of this video. But you don't get a free pass because you made this when you were a baby, Jakey. This is the internet where dreams come to die. Because when you compare Project Warlock to its peers, it's mid as hell. Rudimentary for those of you craving syllables. It's not going to shock or surprise you. The game touts itself as having non-linear levels, varied enemies, and role-playing elements. Yeah, I've been lied to before. It doesn't hurt anymore. The levels are non-linear in that there are corners and doors and it doesn't tell you where to go, but rarely if ever is there more than one path to the end. There's no verticality either. Sure, you run into the odd elevator, but all gameplay happens on the same plane, probably because there's no combat AI. Wanna see how to clear every room in the game? Check it out. There you go, that's it, you win. The enemies beeline towards you like you're an approachably attractive girl at a gaming convention. It doesn't take a genius to abuse this. Using corners to break line of sight will stretch masses of monsters into a manageable conga line, and crossbow bolts pierce enemies. Not only do the bolts pierce, but as long as you don't aim too high, you can pick up every loose bolt. That's infinity piercing attacks. It's so easy to fall into this tactic naturally, but the game even tells you to do this. I forcibly changed my playstyle halfway through the game just so I could feel something again. I realized to be considered a true gamer you have to use the optimal strategy in all times and at all places, and while limiting yourself to imperfect strategies for the sake of fun isn't necessarily a bad thing, but if you have to do it for the whole game, it's a bit of a design flaw. At least there's plenty of options. There are 14 weapons in Project Warlock, and if you're into these types of games, you'll be pretty familiar with the roster. You start with a knife that does tickle damage, and you can throw it, an axe that attacks with a cooldown, a sword that attacks with no cooldown, a staff that uses mana instead of ammo, the ever-reliable pistol, the mandatory shotgun, and its older brother, an SMG that's trying its best, a minigun that doesn't have to try, dynamite, crossbow, rocket launcher, flamethrower, laser gun, and the legally distinct BFG-9000. Most of these weapons can be upgraded by collecting upgrade points scattered throughout the levels. But a lot of these upgrades don't actually change the gunplay. One exception is the nail gun. You could go akimbo with the SMGs because two guns doubles your coolness, right? But the weapon is so inaccurate and weak compared to everything else that having two of them just wastes your ammo twice as fast. So you could do that, or get the nail gun, aim around a corner, and left click until the noises stop. Just watch for ricochets. Magic is also a great way to murder monsters. I say that like you'll be flipping through your spellbook, but there's really only one ability that you need. Mm, this smells like a trap. Storm Rage summons a lightning orb that clears rooms faster than asking people to subscribe to your YouTube channel. It even hits through walls. Some maps are small enough that a well-placed lightning orb clears 90% of the enemies. I... I don't think it's supposed to do that. It completely invalidates all the other spells. Why would you use anything else? It's too powerful. Knives are cool and all, but I'm still bringing a gun to a gunfight. The other spells, from least to most useful, are Gamma Correction. I want to hit them with my sword. I upgraded magic instead of hit points, and now I'm using magic as hit points. Freeze. Literally a grenade, you already have those. Conjure Bullet. And Double All Damage. In a vacuum, these are useful, but they're all eclipsed by the crossbow conga line and kill everything everywhere all at once spell. If all you want is a power fantasy, you'll get a lot from this game. But I understand that this might be the point where many people shelve the game. Not that it's exclusive, but it's up to you to choose fun over function. Calling the game's level and upgrade systems role-playing mechanics is less of a lie and more of a generous stretching of definitions. There are stat points to allocate as you level and 12 talents to choose from. You can put points into strength and life, increasing your melee damage and health for some good old-fashioned rippin' and tearin', ammo capacity for maximum DECA, and mana capacity to cast more lightning orbs. Whatever you choose, just keep in mind there's no ticky backsies Yeah, no respecking, 
and only one save file. Sorry kids, you'll have to wait your turn till daddy's done. This was a conscious decision made by the developers to make the game feel more like a roguelike, what with the limited live system and all that, but playing through it blind you don't know what you're doing, and there is very little information out there. The wiki is woefully incomplete. You're not gonna hamstring yourself to the point you can't progress if you pick something you don't like. It's more of a game feel thing. I certainly restarted after making some uninformed decisions. Okay, so the gameplay is simple with some, let's say, unfortunate oversights. How's the story? Well, I'm gonna spoil it for you. Don't be afraid, it'll be over soon. Ready? Kill Satan. Wow, amazing. Breaking. Destroying ultimate evil isn't a new or creative idea, but it can be a lot of fun. It all comes down to the execution. Shame the bosses fall so flat. I don't really know what I was expecting after solving the game in the first few rooms, but maybe more than this? They're presented as these huge set pieces, but of the five bosses, only the first and last are any interesting. The word interesting doing a lot of heavy lifting there. The bosses seem intimidating at first with the big sprites and open arenas, but they're not even the good old damage sponges of yore. They crumble so pathetically after literal seconds of damage, it... it feels mean. Like watching a kid stand up to his bully just to get absolutely flattened in one punch. Oddly enough, I'd mark the bosses dying so quickly as a point in the game's favor. They certainly don't break up the tempo. Gameplay-wise, there's not much else to say. If you're still here, you're gonna have to derive enjoyment from the game's presentation, which is fantastic. The game feels polished, looks amazing, and sounds great. The art direction is cohesive throughout the entire game, and as for how the levels look, you know what you're getting into. Lots of repeating textures over squares. Thankfully, there's enough variety between episodes to keep things from getting boring. Some maps are better than others. My eyes are angry! You got your spooky castles, arctic wasteland, tropical paradise, hell, and Duke Nukem. And each level takes a different spin on the episode's overall setting. As for the music, well, like the textures, it repeats. It repeats often, and it repeats quickly. Depending on your speed and skill levels, completing the maps will take anywhere from 2 to 10 minutes. And the songs average out at about 3 minutes in length, so you'll be hearing a lot of repeats. These aren't the earworms that inspire people to make acapella videos. Besides that, I don't remember a single track from this game. You'd think with beating this game a couple times and clipping all this footage together, the music would get drilled into my brain, but I just, I, I just don't remember any of them. I don't know if it's a good thing that the repetitive songs are so forgettable. Maybe it's just me. The music does try harder in the later stages, and there's the bones of a good soundtrack here. Wait, what was that? Mmm. Sloppy. I brushed over it before, but visually the game is gorgeous. Not in a you could stare at it for hours kind of way, but as a fantastic example of graphical style and artistic cohesiveness. The sprite work is particularly notable. The animations flow so smoothly for being just a handful of frames, and the models themselves are detailed without being too noisy. Honestly, one thing that kept me playing past the halfway mark was wanting to see what crazy creature came screaming around the next corner. But the monsters aren't the only treat for your eyeballs. Look at this. The game comes packaged with filters and shaders that you can tweak to your heart's desire. It lets you customize your visual experience to emulate whatever piece of shit hardware you had connected to your grandma's basement TV. Oh yeah, it's gaming time. Yeah, it's gimmicky, but you have to remember this game is a love letter to boomer shooters, and this little splash of love really helped sell the nostalgia trip. So, is Project Warlock a great game? No. Is it a bad game? It definitely has its flaws, and despite these shortcomings, I'd still recommend it to anyone who's a fan of these types of games, even if only out of curiosity. Just get it on sale. While it's an achievement its creators should absolutely take pride in, you know, working on it at an age most of us could barely be considered conscious, stacking it up against its library of competitors, the game's really basic. It's not very long or complicated, but I find that plays to its strengths. It won't overstay its welcome. If you're interested at all, you won't be missing much waiting for a sale. I grabbed it at 3 bucks and felt I got my dollar to entertainment value around episode 2. Keep in mind, those are Canadian dollars, so for those of you with real money, the game is practically free. Absolutely worth it if you're after something familiar, mindless, and nostalgic to binge over a weekend. Hey, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, like and subscribe, it really helps out. Or don't, whatever, I don't care. More to come soon.